Funding for this program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and contributions to this station. Coming up, underwater researchers make an unexpected discovery. When we got on the bottom, we were a little confused as to whether we were on the ridge or off the ridge, and then we came across two anchors with chains connected to them, and we were intrigued. And marshalling technology for a better census of the ocean. Dr. Morowski came to us with ideas of how he wanted a system to work, and we took that as, as a group of mechanical, electrical, and software engineers and came up with CBAS. Exploring the frontiers of science. Probing cutting-edge technologies. Seeking answers to the big questions. Welcome to SciTech Central. Even as technology advances at breakneck speed and scientists conduct detailed explorations of extraterrestrial bodies, only about 5% of the ocean floor has been mapped. Project Baseline, a Florida research organization, is helping change that. Exploring the oceans has always been a difficult, dangerous, and expensive proposition. Divers can only explore within a shallow depth and for a short time. Submersibles are expensive and provide only a limited view of their surroundings. But a company in Vero Beach is making new generation subs that greatly expand the ability of researchers to explore the oceans. I think the first thing most people notice when they see the Triton is the acrylic sphere. It has to be optically perfect, dimensionally perfect. If it wasn't perfectly round, it wouldn't be as strong as it needs to be. A great view isn't the only advantage. Researchers can also dive safely for extended periods. We carry 96 hours of reserve life support in addition to our 10 or 12 hours of normal mission time. Because Triton subs are safe and relatively inexpensive, many research groups can utilize them. One such group is Project Baseline out of High Springs, Florida. Project Baseline is really so simple that it's almost too simple. It's about empowering anyone interested in the water to go take a photograph and write a general observational report about what they see about their favorite spot in this world that's water related. During a recent dive off the coast of Lake Worth, Project Baseline teamed up with Nova Southeastern University to explore a large ridge that had been recently discovered. It's a, a very unique opportunity to be able to see something remotely and have questions, all kinds of questions about what's there, and then being able to go visit them is pretty amazing. That's so, the ridge, do you think, runs west. all the way to mm -hmm. Route 1, it's the same ridge? Yes. It looks actually. like it. Yes. They're both on the We're really the not actually looking for point 0.1 or point 0.2. That's really right. We're looking for the ridge. That's right. We haven't been able to explore this ridge because of the depth. It's about 250 feet. It's outside of normal diving limits. And so today we'd like to utilize the submarines to go down and get a good look at what's living down there. My role in this is to take scientists and different researchers from around the globe down into the environment that they normally study purely from a lab or from a remotely operated vehicle by placing them into an HOV, a submersible. We're able to get them immersed in three dimensions. In our modern subs, we're situated inside of an acrylic sphere that's optically matched to seawater. It has air conditioning and communications. There's a surface tracking device. And what I'm doing is taking their locations, tracking it with this boat, and then we've got our chart of the areas we're having them go to. They can't get GPS on the ocean floor, so we're their GPS up on the surface. When we got on the bottom, we were a little confused as to whether we were on the ridge or off the ridge because it wasn't as prominent as we'd hoped. It turns out that we did hit the mark, so we just kind of traversed the area for a while, and then we came across two anchors with chains connected to them, and we were intrigued. One of the biggest differences between going into submersible and scuba diving is the fact that you really get a time to appreciate the environment you're in. There's a little bit less concern as an observer about your buddy and your life support. You really just get to sit there and explore. We weren't looking for a wreck. We were looking for coral and hard bottom structure that naturally provide habitat. And we've unfortunately, in the course of three hours, found none. It was quite a neat sight to be on. There was a lot of fish. 
we saw a large sunfish called a mola mola, which is a very special sight to see, especially in 200 feet of water. Unfortunately, we saw a lot of lionfish, which are invasive species, and they had that wreck pretty well covered. This giant shipwreck was providing this artificial habitat that those fish would have normally sought out natural habitat. But unfortunately, the hard bottom structure, the natural habitat's gone. And we've all got to get a handle on why that's occurred, because that's where the fish are supposed to be living. By accumulating data through many similar outings, Project Baseline expects to establish a universal point of reference for the quality of the aquatic environment. The new students that we have coming in at the moment, their baseline is different. And so I think it's important for Project Baseline to capture that. The sooner we create a stable baseline, pictorially and scientifically, then we're able to monitor at a very effective level where everybody in the community, whether they have a scientific college degree or they're a simple person observing something on TV, they'll get it. And the visual nature of Project Baseline's evidence is what makes it so powerful. The people that don't dive and don't experience the water like we do need to understand the impact of what's going on from what we do in our everyday life, how it's affecting two-thirds of the planet. These great universities and researchers all over the world have volumes of data that explain exactly what's going on, but no one listens and no one reads to the degree that is necessary to cause an emotional response in the general public. An image causes a visceral reaction. What we did today was an experiment with Riverbot. We're testing its stability and how it tracks in the water. And we prefer to understand how this one behaves before we give it power. Okay. We've tested in pools before, but this is our first somewhat open water test. Riverbot is, is really a platform for scientists and students who want to study the lagoons. So we provide Riverbot as a, something like akin to the space shuttle, where other people bring us their payloads, what they want to run in the lagoon as an experiment. We actually have this vision for a student to start in middle school and take their research all the way to a PhD using our platforms and technology. For the Riverbot, we hope to collect data that tells us the water quality, how polluted it is, and from that data, we hope to learn what ways or initiatives we can take to clean the river. The ocean's full of plastic. These elements, these little pieces of plastic may have started off as cups, they may have started off as bags, they could have started off as anything. And we actually found these tangled in with the seaweed that, that comes up on our beaches. And the reason we're concerned about this is that sea turtle hatchings are actually consuming this plastic and it's impacting their health. If the community doesn't know what's going inside their water, then they won't know how to prevent the pollution that's entering the water or what responsibility they need to take on. So when I became involved and started researching ocean health and different bodies of water, that's when I discovered what was happening in the lagoon and it really is a much broader mission for us, but we have to start someone. We're starting here in Brevard because we know everything is connected. How many fish are in the ocean? To help answer that question, scientists at the University of South Florida created sea bass, an underwater camera system that's not only accurate, but is less disruptive than traditional methods. How many fish are there in the Gulf of Mexico? Marine fisheries are responsible for estimating populations to determine the number of fish that can be harvested each year. The process is plagued with controversy. Our initial goal was uh, to try to uh, see if we could add science to this controversy about how many fish there are out on, in this case, the West Florida Shelf, but in general in reef fish systems. Dr. Steve Morosky and a team of scientists tackled the issue head on. Traditional fish count methods included trawling or netting fish off the ocean floor. That's fine if you're working in a sandy habitat or a muddy habitat, but if you're rolling over um, reefs, right, number one, you rip up the net, and number two, you rip up the habitat. After obtaining a grant, Dr. Morowski and his team designed and created the sea bass, or camera-based assessment survey system. Dr. Morowski came to us with ideas of how he wanted a system to work and what he wanted to try to accomplish with it. And we took that as, as a group of mechanical, electrical, and software engineers and, and machinists and technicians and uh, came up with Seabass and developed it and built it. 
The first step was to focus on imaging. We started out with the philosophy of doing both low resolution and high resolution video because the low resolution cameras can be used to size everything that we're seeing in the, in the imagery, but then we have a high resolution video to be able to go back and look and identify with greater detail as to exactly what we're seeing. In addition to that, the communications is a DSL modem, so very similar to your old phone modems, and we can get about a meg and a half of bandwidth to, to send video from the various cameras as well as all the sensor data that we have, uh, such as the altitude and the depth and the water clarity. With a fully functioning computer, six cameras, lights, and other measuring devices, the sea bass is taken out into the Gulf of Mexico on the Weatherbird 2, a 115-foot research vessel belonging to the Florida Oceanographic Institute based in St. Petersburg, Florida. Generally what we do is we navigate out of Tampa Bay. Uh, you know, once we get on site, you know, if we're working in a place such as like the Middle Grounds or a place that's popular for commercial and recreational fishermen, uh, we deal a lot with you know those guys you know in our way if you will while we're doing certain tows or different work uh, and then out in the oil patch it's very busy with uh, offshore supply vessels crew boats uh, the rigs themselves uh, so traffic can be very high out there once they reach their chosen location the sea bass is lowered into the water and towed two to three meters above the gulf floor well we typically tow at about three and a half knots and we are limited to it, currently limited to about 200 meters or 660 feet depth. That's most of the West Florida Shelf, so that's most of the area between the shore of Florida and out to about 100 to 120 miles offshore. So we need good maps ahead of time before we can go out. We need to know what the bathymetry is. And while we're towing the sea bass through the water, we're watching the position of the boat relative to those bathymetry maps, as well as a high resolution sonar on the boat. Bathymetry maps are three dimensional and help the team know where obstacles may be or changes in depth so as to avoid any collisions with reefs or rock outcroppings. And it's really fascinating because you think off the co west coast of Florida that's well explored and we know what's there, and actually the opposite is true. There's very few high resolution maps of the bottom depths out there, and so in some sense we're flying blind over very large areas. The visibility of the water, the temperature, water temperatures and the pressures that, you know, um, um, make it much more difficult to point a camera at a fish under there as opposed to through the piece of glass in an aquarium. Hundreds of hours of video are collected on a typical eight to 10 day trip at sea. I am the one that goes through all the video. I watch it um, and I do fish counts and identification first. And then after that, I convert those counts to density using the high resolution bathymetry maps that we have and also calculating the field of view that I've seen in the in that video and then extrapolate that to dent the total abundance estimates that could potentially be in the areas that we've sampled. One thing that we're very conscious of is the fact that a certain proportion of fish may be scared away by the system. Trying to estimate what level that is is something that I've been working on as well as how it varies from species to species. Sarah Grasty is now able to provide accurate information on the number and species of fish in the reef and rocky areas in the Gulf. We concentrate our effort in the areas we think the fish are gonna be while still making sure that we cover all the potential habitats. She's observed a variety of interesting species, but sometimes her monitors are filled by those lovable dolphins. The dolphins love our system. Uh, the theory, our theory is that they like the altimeter because it's pinging constantly. Also, they're playful. They might just want to swim alongside it because it's something different. It's interesting, it's fun, it's cool when you see them for the first maybe five minutes, but we've had them hang around for an upwards of three hours. They're fun for a little bit and then they're more of a hindrance than anything. Although dolphins may scare away the fish, these scientists have learned that the sea bass itself is ignored by most species. Uh, Sarah, my graduate student, was able to show that for most of these species, they're pretty much neutral to this device. So we're cautiously optimistic that we've developed a tool that can gather the data we need and it's without serious bias in order to, to do these counts. 
Traditional techniques of developing fish estimates date back to the 19th century, but there's typically a two-year lag time on getting the data. With the sea bass, valuable information can be delivered in just a few weeks. So the hope for the future is um, once we have you know, proven that this is a viable, um, accurate way to determine fish abundance is to implement it in, in fisheries management. There's been many examples of overfishing of stocks to the point where they've collapsed. And so what we want to do is basically inject new science into this whole, um, this whole management paradigm to assure that there's adequate uh, reproduction and adequate spawners for the future so that these populations can exist. By bringing together filmmakers, researchers, and activists, the Blue Ocean Film Festival in Tampa raises awareness about the oceans. One supporter and participant in the festival is a famous aquanaut who recently completed a 31-day underwater adventure in the Florida Keys. The Blue Ocean Film Festival is meant to be a platform for raising awareness and getting people engaged in ocean and environmental stewardship. And we use film as our tool of empowerment feel like it's the most powerful tool we have to reach people to help understand why things matter, why the oceans matter. Debbie Kinder is the executive director of the Blue Ocean Film Festival and works with those who explore and study the oceans. One who became a supporter of the film festival early on is the grandson of famed aquanaut Jacques Cousteau. Fabien Cousteau is, he, he feels almost like family to us. He's been with us and a part of Blue since 2009. I think the Blue Ocean Film Festival is a phenomenal platform to give a voice for the oceans. We can bring in explorers, we can bring in scientists, uh, storytellers, and we can bring in the general public so that there is that nice intermingling uh, that people can really uh, mix together in a, in a beautiful soup. Fabian Cousteau came to the festival to share his Mission 31 project, a 31-day underwater adventure in the Florida Keys. I wanted to do Mission 31 for several reasons. One, it was always a fantasy of mine to live underwater. I feel more comfortable in, in the ocean than I do on land. Uh, but more importantly than that, it was to relay back a sense of the human ocean connection the way my grandfather did in his day. There's no better way to do that than to live on that oceanic frontier. Cousteau and his research team lived in the Aquarius, an underwater habitat in the Florida Keys operated by Florida International University. Now, a habitat is a house underwater, and the front door is open to the environment. So that means that you're saturating and you're saturated at the pressure depth equal to where you are. And that gives you an unbelievable gift, the luxury of time. Because you're saturated, you can go out six, eight, 10, 12 hours a day if you want and really study things the way they should be. What's even better than that is that the environment itself the residents, your new neighbors, actually start accepting you more and more as part of the background rather than a foreign visitor. Uh, for us, 31 days offered us over three years worth of science and data. The Mission 31 team recorded and evaluated a massive amount of data. One area of study included man-made pollution, we're able to test for some of the particulates, the, 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 the inorganic chemical and, and other matter that is generated by human activity and how that affects the coral reefs and in what doses it's present. They also discovered a major reduction of predator fish in the area. And how when you knock off all the predators on a reef, what changes in the dynamic of the coral reef and why is it a detriment? Why do the foragers all of a sudden create uh, a detriment to that otherwise equilibrium uh, on that coral reef? 
Today, predator fish like bluefin tuna and grouper are on the decline due to overfishing. This creates a dangerous imbalance. It knocks everything off kilter. And it's not necessarily just for nature's sake that I'm saying this, but it's also very much a pragmatic reason that we need to pay attention to these things. The ocean is the circulatory system of all life that we know and depend on. We wouldn't be doing things like injecting ourselves with poisons and taking our own organs out unless absolutely necessary. Why are we doing that to the ocean? One might think living at the bottom of the ocean disconnects you from the rest of the world. However, at Mission 31, scientists were connected via Wi-Fi to students everywhere. We were able to reach over 70,000 students and adults uh, in different venues, whether it was the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, where they had 5,000 people talking to us, or whether it was a school in uh, China uh, or India or, uh, or Eastern Europe or Africa. Uh, we're six people living in a habitat for 31 days, and the habitat itself is the size of a school bus. Drawing from insights from his grandfather, Fabian Cousteau is on a mission to share his stories with as many people as he can. With Mission 31, I'll, I'll start by saying something that my grandfather used to say all the time and really rings true today. Um, he said, people protect what they love. But how can people protect what they don't understand? Um, and so Mission 31 and Blue are ways where we can connect with people and have them better understand how amazing this planet is, especially the ocean. After 31 days, Fabian and his team splash up from the bottom. Four months later, Fabian and colleagues gathered together at the Blue Ocean Film Festival for learning, encouraging, and connecting. Through films and symposiums, the world's best oceanographers and scientists came together to share their insights. Those who do gather here have a, a common body of caring, in a way. You wouldn't be here otherwise. But there's this universe of people out there who don't know what those gathered here know. And there's a, a chance to magnify the view. And I think that's what happens at the Blue Ocean Film Festival. Blue is, is a organizing principle where you actually collide filmmakers, activists, and scientists. And you don't tell them the script. You collide them. And out of that collision, great things happen. But the whole human element is the most exciting thing about this. And it's, there's this whole energy that's greater than the sum of its parts by the level of visionaries and icons and just people on the cutting edge that, that come, when they come together, there's just something magic that happens. And hopefully when we walk away from a platform like Blue Ocean Film Festival, not only are we richer inside with uh, those stories and, and passion and information, but then we become the storytellers and tell our friends and family, our decision makers, uh, so that we can be positive influences as well. That's all for now on SciTech Central. Thanks for watching. Join us next week for more stories from the frontiers of science and technology. Funding for this program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and contributions to this station.